This is Home Value Stories. I'm Jamie Owen. I just wanted to take a minute to thank you so much for listening to my show. I realize it's not as polished as many podcasts are out there. And I don't have an editor, and that's probably painfully obvious sometimes. I do some editing on my own. And when I release this into podcast land, sometimes I'll be driving around in my car listening to my episode just to make sure I don't sound like a complete idiot. And sometimes I listen to the episode and think, not bad, not half bad. And at other times I think to myself, oh, Jamie, you you shouldn't be podcasting, honestly. Grammar, redundancy, ay yay ay. Anyway. I digress, but I do sincerely appreciate you listening in as I uh, talk about real estate and valuations. I hope that you find it enjoyable and find it a little bit useful. Let me ask you a question. How many decisions do you make before buying something? And it could it can be anything. How many decisions do you make? How many decisions do we generally make as humans? We make a number of decisions before we buy something. And it's not just based upon one metric. Did you know that By some estimates, on average, most adults make about 35,000 choices per day. According to researchers at Cornell University, we make about 226 decisions each day about food alone. And in my household, that's probably just for dinner. But can you imagine making a decision about what we're going to have for dinner based upon one metric? For instance, can you imagine going to a restaurant and saying, I'd like anything that has 600 calories. Just whatever it is, if it's 600 calories, that's what I'm going to take. Well, 600 calories could be a a sugary soft drink or a salad. So they're completely different, but if you're measuring just by the calories, they may look the same. What about something a little more serious than food? What about a vehicle? Can you imagine buying a car simply based upon its weight? According to MechanicBase.com, a 2018 Mercedes-Benz C-Class weighs 3,417 pounds. A 2018 Ford Fusion weighs 3,427 pounds, nearly the same weight. And yet these are completely different cars with different qualities, different looks, different appeal. Clearly, when we're buying a vehicle, we have to make a lot of decisions about the kind of vehicle that we want, above and beyond how much it weighs. Since we have to make multiple decisions when it comes to the food we're going to eat or the type of vehicle we want to buy, well, then how much more so the greatest investment in most people's lives are homes? People don't buy homes based solely on the square footage of the home. Now, obviously, that's a big part of the decision-making process, but there are other things that most buyers are looking for. Quality, condition, view, location, amenities. Does it have a finished walkout basement? Does it have a two- or three-car garage? How many bathrooms does it have? All of those things usually make a difference to a buyer. And so those are things that real estate appraisers 
have to analyze in our developing of our opinion of value. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not poo-pooing the idea of establishing the value of your home based upon its price per square foot. The point, though, is that there's a lot more that really has to be considered than just that metric. I also realize that most people who are not appraisers don't know how to really analyze those other differences and measure them. Let's take a little break, and then after the break, I'll share a story with you that helps you to appreciate why pricing per square foot can get you into a little bit of trouble when it comes to pricing accurately. And I'll give you some tips that can help you if you do want to price your home based on its gross living area. Home Value Stories is sponsored by Find My Appraiser. FindMyAppraiser.com is a network of trusted, knowledgeable local appraisers dedicated to delivering accurate, quality valuations for your home or business. If you're looking for an excellent appraiser in your area, go to FindMyAppraiser.com. They have the best appraisers. Let me share a story with you about a home that I appraised where my opinion of value was less than the contract price. This was a 900 square foot ranch style home in a residential neighborhood. It had been recently updated a a number of years before it was listed. And there were very few comparable sales in the neighborhood, although I was able to find some. Now, the listing agent told me that because they had a hard time finding comparable sales, they used a home that had sold in the neighborhood for $118,000, which had a square footage of 660 square feet of gross living area. So what they did is they took the $118,000, they divided it by the 660 square feet, and they came up with a price per square foot of $178. So their list price was $160,000, and the contract price was just under that. But the real question is, was the $178 per square foot really reflective of the market? Well, there's a couple of things that we have to consider. Now, first, let me point out that when it comes to gross living area, and lot size, the smaller the square footage, the larger the price per square foot. This is based on the laws of diminishing return. So as a home gets larger in square footage of gross living area or lot size, the price per square foot actually goes down. That's something to keep in mind. So establishing a price per square foot on a 900 square foot home using a 660 square foot home, probably not a good idea. When completing a real estate appraisal, appraisers have to determine what the market is paying, not just per square foot, but for all of the other amenities that I discussed earlier. So in this case, using a depreciated cost new method and multiple regression, I estimated that the market was paying between 45 and $55 per square foot for homes that are comparable to this property. The market was paying about $2 per square foot for acreage. Basement finished square footage was between $10 and $15 per square foot. Now that's above and beyond just the size of the basement. That's additional for having a finished square footage. The garage in this neighborhood, they were going for between six and $10,000 per garage space. Bathrooms were between $4,000 and $6,000 per bathroom. The market was paying between $3,000 and $5,000 per bedroom. Now, I applied those adjustments to three sales that were truly comparable to the subject property in the subject neighborhood that had sold in the last year. And those sales adjusted to a range of $137,500 to $141,000. 
So you can imagine that my opinion of value fell somewhere between there, which was a lot less than the $160,000 that the home was listed for. Now, here's something that's interesting as well about this situation. The property that I was appraising had been remodeled by an investor the year prior to its being listed. And the the homeowners purchased it for $140,000. And they didn't really make any major improvements to the property. They did do some cosmetic things, but nothing major. And now, about a year later, they're asking $160,000. Now, in today's market, that might be a different story because the market is on fire right now in Northeast Ohio and most parts of the country. But at that point, Home prices in that neighborhood for single-family homes were fairly flat. So why was their home now worth $160,000 when they had purchased it in its renovated state a year ago for $140,000? Where is their difference? Where is their support for that? I couldn't find any, and I had some good comparable sales. So that's some food for thought. Now, you might be wondering, with the comparable sales that I used, what were the prices per square foot of those sales? And by the way, they were much more comparable to the subject property than that 660 square foot home that the agent used to come up with their price per square foot. The price per square foot of the homes that I used were $153, $159, and $168 per square foot, with the two most comparable sales being $153 and $159 per square foot. The one property that I used that had $168 per square foot had a lot size that was nearly double that of the subject property. So when you think about it, using a price per square foot metric can work. It can get you into the ballpark of an accurate opinion of value, but you have to use the most comparable sales. So let me offer you some tips that can help you if you're trying to price your home. First of all, you'll want to find homes with similar locations. And I know that that goes without saying, right? Location, location, location. But location is important. So if you have a home that does not offer golf course frontage or lake frontage, well, you obviously wouldn't want to use sales that do have golf course frontage or lake frontage and vice versa. If you have a home with golf course frontage, you're gonna wanna use sales with golf course frontage. You also wanna use sales that are in the neighborhood, if at all possible, and that have sold uh, fairly recently. You'll also wanna look for homes that have a similar lot size. Lot size doesn't always make a difference in value, but a lot of times it will. And in the example that I gave earlier, lot size did make a difference in value. You'll also want to find homes that have similar foundations. Now that that may sound weird at first, but think about this. Obviously a home without a basement is going to generally have a lesser market value than a home with a basement. And a home with an unfinished basement is going to have a lesser market value than a home with a finished basement or partly finished basement. So foundations need to be similar. And speaking about foundations, if you have a split level home or you're using a split level home as one of the sales that you are trying to derive a value for your home on, you really have to use some extreme caution. Split level homes get really dicey because there are multiple levels. Some are partly below grade and the county auditor may be reflecting those partially below grade areas as gross living area. They may also be including them as basement area. Some auditors will include them as both. So you really have to be consistent when it comes to foundations if you want to get your price per square foot right. Another key factor in pricing your home right is to make sure that you understand what the accurate gross living area of your home is. If you have any question about what your gross living area actually is, you can hire a real estate appraiser to come and measure your home to 
to make sure you have the right square footage. Sometimes when there is an issue with value, I find that that's the case. Some of my opinions of value on a purchase are less than the purchase price because the square footage is actually less than public records show. And in some cases, my opinion of value is higher than the contract price because the home is actually larger than public records show. The price per square foot was based on a lesser square footage. So in some cases, the seller's leaving money on the table because their home might be larger than they realize. If you're using a price per square foot method, you'll also want to make sure that the sales that you use to derive that price per square foot are really comparable in terms of condition and quality of construction. If you're looking at homes with the same gross living area, they may have differences in condition or quality that make an impact on market value. So you want to make sure that they're as comparable as you can find when it comes to condition and quality. Now, after you've narrowed things down and you may have a a pool of relatively comparable sales, the last thing you can do to try to fine tune that price per square foot is to bracket all of these different things that I've mentioned. So if you have a, a home with one acre of property, try to find a home with a little less acreage that's comparable to yours and one with a little bit more. The same with square footage. If you have a gross living area of 2,000 square feet, try to find a sale with a little bit less and a little bit more. In the example that I gave earlier, if the agent had used sales with a larger square footage than that property that they were selling, that would have helped them get into a better, more accurate ballpark of value for that home. So those are just a few tips that uh, can help you to price your home accurately. And if you're having a hard time doing so, by all means, pick up the phone and call a real estate appraiser in your area. If you're in Northeast Ohio, give me a ring. But if you're in another part of the country, uh, go to findmyappraiser.com and find an appraiser that can help you to price your home accurately. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Home Value Stories. I just wanted to thank you again for getting together with me and talking about real estate valuations. I hope that you find these episodes to be a little bit entertaining and that they offer you at least a little something that will help you in valuing your home or understanding the valuation process. I'm going to start something new for this episode and future episodes, at least for a while. As you may or may not realize, I'm a husband and a dad. And one of my great joys in life is telling bad dad jokes and using bad puns to make my family sigh. And I thought, well, why just limit it to my family and friends when I can share these bad dad jokes with you as well? So here we go. My bad dad joke for this episode. I used to be a narcissist, but look at me now. Now, if you didn't get that joke, well, let me tell another one. What's the difference between a poorly dressed man on a tricycle and a well-dressed man on a bicycle? A tire. And there you go. If you'd like to learn more about my company, Aspen Appraisal Services, go to aspenappraisalservices.net. And if you enjoy reading about real estate-related topics, check out my blog at the clevelandappraisalblog.com. Again, thanks for being here, and we'll look forward to visiting with you on our next episode. Be safe out there. I hope that all of your stories are happy ones.